cash flows happen at the end of each day. You can't just predict what they will start at the end, right? Yeah, so, so if you're at the end of the day, it's whenever you're going to pay taxes. So it's really not a choice. Once you've sort of shown the way you pay taxes, you have to claim the tax benefit at that time. You can't claim it at the start of the year if your tax year being paid at the end of the year. Okay, folks, let's... Okay, let's get started. So I think I've returned all the discounted cash flow valuations that were sent to me. So I sent that email out yesterday and about a dozen came in after that saying, you know, it got missed and some of them got missed because just they got missed and some got missed because the subject, there's a reason I'm so fixated on the subject, you know why I do it, right? Because it goes into a mailbox or all of the emails relating to this are in one place. If they go into my regular mailbox, they're going to be, it's easy to miss because there are, you know, you, there are more emails coming, not just from this class, but from other things. So, so when I suggest a subject, please don't try to be clever. Like some of you said, my imperfect DCF, I know, you know, the, you, so you, it doesn't seem like much of a change, but remember, the computer doesn't know. So when it says imperfect, it doesn't match my. So, so uh, you'll see this as a pattern. Whenever I ask you to send something, I'll ask it with a specific subject matter. It just makes my job a little easier. So I'll cut to the chase. The word that I used most frequently when I responded to you was not a curse word. It was the word story. And if you look at your response, it's often around your story. So here are the three forms it takes. Your best case scenario is a hey, nice story. Your numbers are tied to your story. Your value reflects your numbers. You're done. That doesn't mean I like your story. It's, it's your story. So basically, I'm saying you have a story to tell. You've told the story. The numbers match the story. Your valuation reflects the numbers. That is the core evaluation. Here's the second set of responses you'll get. I see your story, but I see tensions within your story. Let me explain. You have a company whose revenues increase tenfold. Okay, you have a story of high growth. Its margins quadruple at the same time. The tension in the story is if you're pushing for higher revenue growth, usually you have to give up on pricing. So tell me what's unique about the company. Tell me the piece in this company that allows you to pull that off. 
So essentially, I'm not asking you to change the story. I'm saying come in and fill in that detail, because as you think about the detail, you might rethink your story. Because here's, I think, the weakness we all have when we tell stories about companies. We forget the rest of the world exists, right? So we take our company, we look at the big market, we talk about all the great things we're going to be doing because we see the big market, but we forget that there are other people looking at that same market, going after that same potential, and our story, so it's, that's the difference between a business story and a fictional story. In a fictional story, you control the entire environment. You can make characters do whatever they, you want them to do, make your story go to an ending that you want. But in a business story, that's something you have to think about, is as your company moves, why is the rest of the world not moving with it? And maybe there's a good reason. Maybe you have a barrier to entry. Maybe you have a competitive advantage. Tell me what that is as part of your story. And here's the third set of responses, where all I got was numbers from you. And when you send me numbers, whether you want to or not, you're telling me an implicit story, right? You see how? Because what I look at is I look at your revenue growth, I look at your margins, I look at your reinvestment, and I try to reverse engineer the story, which I shouldn't be doing. You should be telling me the story. So for some of you, I said, here's the story I see in your numbers. Do you like your story? And if your answer to that is no, then don't come back to me and say, what's a better story to tell? You have to come up with something that actually makes sense to you. To me, investing is about taking ownership of your story. This is not the story that analysts are saying. This is not the story that Elon Musk is saying about Tesla. If you're going to invest in a company, you have to claim ownership. It's not an easy process, right? Because you have to think, everything about the business affects your story, and you're never going to be certain. So today, we're actually going to talk about what to do with the valuation you have now. Because let's face it, you found one of three things. Either your company is valued exactly at its price, which makes me very suspicious. Or more commonly, you're going to get one of the two other outcomes. So your value is lower than the price or higher than the price. So today, we're going to talk about pricing. But before I do that, a couple of reminders. One is the quiz is on Wednesday. It'll cover only the part through last session. So it's the intrinsic valuation section. But today, I want to do the last part of packet one because it lays the foundations for thinking about the difference between the value you come up with for your company and the price you see for your company. So to set this process up, let's start off with the, the start of the class test. Right? I'm going to give you a rationale for a lot of people using pricing. At the very start of this class, I told you that 9 out of 10 valuations are really pricing. You price the company and you reverse engineer it using a multiple or comparable. So a lot of analysts prefer to use multiples, PE ratios, EV to EBITDA. And we push them on it and say, why do you stick with multiples? Why don't you do discounted cash flow valuation? One reason that they give is they don't like to make all those assumptions you need to make when you do a discounted cash flow valuation. Let's start with the, the part of that statement that's absolutely true. Did you have to make a lot of assumptions when you valued your company? In fact, w there wasn't a single number that wasn't an assumption, right? So even if you use last year's numbers, you are in fact assuming something about your company. So you're saying, I'm going to do a pricing because I don't like to make assumptions about cash flows, growth, and risk. So let me ask you a question. When you use a multiple, a PE ratio of 22, an EV to EBITDA of 8, are you avoiding this problem making assumptions? Are you making assumptions about growth and cash flows and risk? Implicitly, you are. In fact, one of the things we're going to talk about is how to take that 22 PE ratio and back out from it, your own assumptions about growth and risk and cash flow, so you can look at them and say, I'm OK with this, or I'm not OK with it. So if you're going to use pricing, don't do it because you don't like to make assumptions. Do it for some other reason. We'll talk about good reasons for doing pricing. But this isn't one of those reasons. So let's build on top of this. Right? The biggest challenge in pricing is statistical. Because what are you doing in pricing? You're taking a sample, right? A sample of 20 companies or 25 companies. You're extrapolating from that sample to make a judgment about your company. And in statistics, when you talk about samples, you have to talk about distributions. Why? Because that's what allows you to make judgments about numbers from samples. So let's assume you take the PE ratio for every company in the market. There are thousands of companies. You compute the PE ratio for all of them. You put them in a histogram. You know what a histogram is? Remember that? You count the number of stocks, PE 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, put it up in a histogram. 
can that distribution ever be normal? This is the question I'm asking. You take the PE ratios for every company, you put in a distribution. Can the distribution of PE ratios ever be normal? What's the essence of a normal distribution? What's the, what are the limits on a normal distribution? Numbers have to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? The tails stick out on both sides. Now, let's think about PE ratios. What's the lowest value PE ratio can take? I've never seen a PE ratio below zero. In fact, if the earnings are negative, the PE ratio becomes not meaningful. You see not available, not meaningful. So the lowest value a PE ratio can take is zero, right? What's the highest value you can have for a PE? It's unbounded. In fact, I'm going to show you the distribution for US stocks. And you're going to see companies with PE ratios of 10,000, 15,000, 18,000. Why? Because as the earnings per share drops to a fraction of a cent, your PE ratio will explode. So your distribution is going to be floored on one side. It can't be less than zero. It has a tail on the other side. It's what in statistics we call an asymmetric or a skewed distribution. Sounds like inside statistics. It's going to have huge implications to how we use PE ratios, EV to EBITDA multiples. And we'll talk about why you have to be careful about parameters you get out of this distribution. Finally, let's think about applying pricing. Right? All too often, when you see pricing done, it's actually very naively done. You take the PE ratio of your company. Let's assume it's 12. You look at the average for the sector, which is 20. And you tell me, based on that comparison, your stock is cheap. You're saying, this is simplistic. Nobody would. You'd be surprised how much of equity research is built on this very simple proposition. Take the, mu the multiple for your company, compute the average for the sector, make the comparison. So if I just gave you these numbers, can you conclude from this that the stock is cheap? Why not? What am I, what am I not controlling for when I say the stock is cheap based on that comparison? All you have to think about is why a company might have a low PE ratio and still be fairly priced. Think about the fundamentals. What are the things that drive the pricing of stock? The growth, the risk, and the cash flows, right? I've already given you the clues. So this stock could be cheap, or it could have the lowest growth rate in the sector, much lower growth rate. It could be cheap, or it could be the riskiest stock in the sector. It could be cheap, or it could have the lowest return in equity. This is why the fundamentals matter, because when you see a stock look cheap, and I'm going to make this statement up front and try to back it up. 95% of stocks that look cheap deserve to be cheap. The essence of relative valuation of pricing is to find that 5% that are actually cheap and you want to buy. So separating the 95 from the 5 becomes the entire game of pricing. And we're going to talk about some techniques you can use to control for differences. So let's go back to the very last part of packet one. If you didn't bring packet two, not a big deal because we're just going to get started on packet two today. Let's talk about closing the deal. And this is really so that you can have a pathway to go from what you have now, which is a value and a price for your company, to remember what you're required to do, make a decision, right? Buy, sell. So let me set up the process using a picture I showed you at the very start of this class. For 16 sessions now, this is the 16th session of the class, we've talked about the value process, right? Cash flows, growth and risk, discounted cash flow valuation. We know what drives the value of a company. Even though you might not like DCF, we know that the value of a company is driven by its cash flows, its growth and its risk. Okay? We're in slide 340 of the first packet. Yeah. It's, it's missing? No? So if you look at the value process, the value process, we use discounted cash flow value. And that's where we are right now. That's where you are in your company. Now let's think about the pricing process. Your stock is being priced in the market out there, right? If it's a private company, obviously, the pricing, it's not that there's no pricing, but the pricing is ha happening in the background. It's going to show up if you try to sell your company. Let's think about what drives price. It's demand and supply, right? And what drives demand and supply? It could be mood, it could be momentum, it could be all kinds of things. All that behavioral stuff that we, we brought to the surface in the last 30 years, big area of finance, it's all about pricing and why the price might be different from the value. In fact, if you think about the value process delivering value, the pricing process delivering price, all of investing can be boiled down to looking at that gap, right? Because 
So if you start off by saying there is no gap, what must you believe about markets? If you're an efficient, so if, you're, if you believe in efficient markets, you're going to say there is no gap, or what looks like a gap is fiction, in which case what should you do? Don't waste your time doing valuation. Just put your money in index funds and go make your money somewhere else, right? Be an engineer, be a banker, be a doctor, be whatever. No, it's too late for you to be a doctor, but no, whatever you need to be. No. But the, all evaluation really comes down to is there a gap? And if there's a gap, how do we take advantage of it? So at this moment, what have you told me when you sent your valuation? Most of you have told me, here's my value, here's the price, there is a gap. Right? That's all we have right now is a, is, a, is a number. So let's think about what causes that gap in the first place. Because to make money, what has to happen? Even if you're correct about there being a gap, to make money, the gap has to close. right? So let's talk about how or what might cause the gap. Because if you get that, you've really cracked the code in investing. right? Because you can value companies. That's only half the game. You now have to tell me what you think will cause the gap to close. So let me take you back to pricing 101. Because in a sense, when I talk about pricing, and I talk about demand and supply, you're saying it's a big deal, right? So a classic example of pricing is real estate. So every winter for the last 27, maybe more, 31, the question I ask myself is, what the hell am I doing in this part of the country? That feeling rises to the surface every time I have to shovel snow, because that is, to me, the, the place where I said, this is such a waste of my time. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to have a heart attack. On, I need to move. So about two years ago, after a particularly bad snowstorm, I come into the garage. I throw the shovel into the side of the garage. I walk into the house. And my wife was born and raised in California, so she's hated the winter even more than I do. So I said, and we have to move. I hadn't even finished saying it. She was checking out housing prices. In the most expensive part of the most expensive state in the Union. So California is already an expensive state. She goes to La Jolla. This is a hut in La Jolla. How do I know it's a hut? There are only six numbers in the price. <laughs> La Jolla, anything below a million, that's probably a hovel. You know, 995,000. Let me ask you a question. You've seen this play out in the real estate market. If you bought an apartment or a house, think about how that number gets set. The realtor shows you the house. The name's a number, right? You're saying she must be doing an intrinsic valuation, a discounted care. No, she's not. She's setting the number based on how similar assets or similar houses have been priced, and she's doing it. In fact, to see how little there is in this process, if you ever go on Zillow and you check out a house, you'll see something called a Z-estimate. You can actually take every house in a neighborhood, and Zillow has a Z-estimate for that house. Every single house. You're saying, they must have a ton of analysts working it through. They have none of the sort. They basically take all of the data on transactions in an area, and they use it to adjust for things that they think should be adjusted for the size of your lot, the number of bedrooms, whether you have a finished basement or not. It's a regression analysis they've run. They can give you a Z estimate, which actually is just as good as hiring a real estate a realtor to put a number on a house. So there's really no rocket science. It's pure pricing. Nobody cares about cash flows. Nobody cares about growth. And this is true not just for residential real estate. It's also true for commercial real estate. If you decide to buy a property on Fifth Avenue, you could take the rental income and play games with it. But the biggest number in your valuation is going to be what you think you can sell this property for 10 years from now, which is coming from the pricing market today. So all of real estate is pricing. You're saying those unsophisticated realtors. Let's take something very different, different market. It's a sell side equity research report. Now, if you've ever seen your share of these, I mean, they come out of equity research departments. I've hidden the name of the bank involved. Not that there's anything particularly embarrassing, but there might be. This is a classic sell-side equity research report that says I should buy BB Biotech. I've never heard of the company. But basically, here's what the buy recommendation is based on. They've, the analyst computed a multiple at which this company was trading at, compared it to the multiple that similar companies were being priced at, 
and made a comparison, very similar to the example that I showed you. Let me ask you a uh, question. The realtor attached a price to your house based on similar houses in the neighborhood, right? The equity research analyst is pricing your company based on similar companies in the market. Who do you think is on more solid ground, the realtor or the equity research analyst? So the question I'm asking, is it easier to find five houses like yours or is it easy to find five companies like Microsoft? To me, the answer is a no-brainer. Realtors have a much stronger basis for pricing than equity research analysts have because it's easier to find similar, similar assets out there than it is in the market. Much of what passes for valuation in the market is pricing. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a different way of attaching a number to your company. So. We know what drives valuation. You've seen these four questions. Every time I want to value a company, I go back to these questions. What are the cash flows from existing assets? What's the value added from growth? That's where the growth rate and the reinvestment came in. How risky is this company brought to the discount rate? What's the value of this company when it becomes a mature company? Right? Here's what drives pricing. The first is mood and momentum. Pricing is driven by market mood and momentum. Just take a look at what the last 11 days. Each day you get these spikes in the, the S&P 500, the drop in the S&P 500. At this stage, it's all mood and momentum driving the market. Mood about who's going to win the election, what the consequence. There's really no intrinsic valuation behind it. It's mood and momentum. And to show you how strong this can be, I actually found a study that looked at Soccer-loving countries, the day after the soccer team in that country lost a big game. So it was like the Euro Cup, the World, I mean, so basically they took all these big games and they looked at what happened the day after in the stock market of that country. So imagine the day after Brazil loses 7-2 to Germany. Next morning the market opens up. You know what the study found? It's going to be down 2 to 3%. Why? It's not because the intrinsic value changed, but everybody's in a really shitty mood. They come in and say, sell everything. The world is ending. You think that makes no sense. Remember, in pricing, that's not your job and my job to pass judgment on. It is what drives markets. So it's mood and momentum. The second is liquidity. Whenever you hear talk about float and liquidity, does that affect value? Not really. Value is what it is. You know where it shows up? It shows up in pricing because if you have an illiquid market, prices can move much more dramatically simply because big trades in one direction or the other can cause the pricing to be different from value. So any talk of liquidity is a pricing concern. So mood matters, liquidity matters. Pricing is driven by incremental information. You know what incremental information is? Tiny little pieces of news. I'm not even sure the news can move the price. I'll give you an example. This is about three years ago, around one of the new iPhone the introductions that Apple was doing, new iPhone 5 or 6. I'm checking, I mean, I'm checking out Apple's stock price on my computer because I was doing a valuation. As, as I'm watching it, it's down 3.5%. Remember, 3.5% down for Apple is you've just wiped out about $25 billion in value. I said, what the hell happened here? So I go looking through the news stories. I see nothing in the news. Then I dig deeper, I discovered that the market was reacting to a tweet, one tweet, from a guy supposedly in China, we don't even know what he is in China, supposedly standing outside the Apple store in Shanghai, and he's tweeting, there's nobody waiting in line for the new iPhone. $20 billion in value disappears. We have no idea whether the tweet is true, whether it's coming from even in China. For all you know, this guy's sitting right outside the room that you're and tweeting this out and making it look like you said incremental information, tiny little pieces of news and non-news can drive price down. And finally, the nature of pricing. Is you know what your biggest source of information is? What are you looking at? Remember the old Keynesian description of a, mar of a beauty contest? Your objective in a beauty contest is not to decide who the best looking person on the stage is, it's to decide who the other judges will think that the best looking person is. So you're not even looking at the stage, you're looking at the other people. It's like the voice, you're not even listening to other people. Anybody swings a chair around, you swing it around too, saying, that must have been a good song. You could be deaf, and you could be on the voice and nobody would know, right? All you have to do is three chairs turn around, you turn around too. 
If nobody's turning around, you don't turn. That's pretty much what drives pricing. Your biggest source of information is watching other people trade because you're trying to get information from it. The pricing game is a very different game than the value game. The tools you will use in pricing will not be the tools you'd have used in valuation because your tool has to detect shifts in mood and momentum, right? So guess what? If you use charts, you know how technical analysis works, right? There are support lines and resistance lines and all these neat little graphs. I still remember getting a gift of a book on Japanese candlestick charting. First time I got the book, I said, this is a decoration book? I'm not interested in candlesticks of the Japanese. Why am I getting this book? Open it up, it's hundreds of charts supposedly telling you what's going to happen next in the market. My first reaction is, this is stupid. My second reaction is, if it works, it works. Because what's your objective in pricing is to find something in the chart that will tell you whether there's been a shift in mood and momentum. So before you reject charting and technical analysis, it might actually be a better tool if you're pricing than doing a discounted cash flow valuation. So when you think about the value game and the pricing game, it's good to step back and realize they're two very different games. And the question then becomes, what game did you come to play? And to me, that boils down to what you think about the gap. So if you say, what gap? There is no gap. You're an efficient market person. I essentially say, OK, I understand where you're coming from. Internally, you're consistent with what you're doing. You don't value companies. You essentially put your money in index funds and ETFs, and you move on. If you're a value extremist, I'll uh, talk about why I put in the extremist. Here's what you believe. You believe that the only thing that matters is value. The people who do pricing are shallow, stupid people. And that sooner or later, the truth will prevail, and the truth will be yours. You're extremely righteous about the whole thing. Go to Omaha every year, and you will get a sense of what I mean by righteousness. We're the chosen ones. We do all the stuff you're supposed to do. They're also shallow. The truth will prevail. So basically, you value the company, and you're convinced the price will move to you because you have truth on your side. One of my favorite shows to be on on CNBC is Fast Money. Do you watch Fast Money? Basically, I get on with five traders. And they tell me up front, don't talk about it, even before the camera comes in. Why are you wasting your time on this value stuff? Who cares? And you know what? I respect that, because they're traders. They're saying, I'm a trader. How do you make money as a trader? You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price, right? That's it. It's as simple as that. You're saying, what if the value doesn't support it? Who cares? You're going to get really rich along the way if you can buy at a low price and sell at a high price. So here's how traders think about the world. They think the people who do valuation are pointy-headed intellectuals. So check your head out already. You know. That you do this game playing with cash flows and risk and growth. Who cares? The market sets a price. Your job is to essentially buy at a low price and sell at a high price. You really don't even care about the value. So if you're a pricing extremist, you say, I don't care about value. If you're a value extremist, you say, I don't care about price. And unfortunately, we're stuck in the middle because each of these groups has its own weakness. So let's look at the prices. So if you're a trader, all you care about is the price. Here are your weaknesses. The first is you have no anchor, right? So you don't know what the value of something is. Essentially, you're going to be reacting to whatever the market tells you the number is. So today, Amgen could be worth 155. You're OK with it. Tomorrow, it's at 139. You've got to be OK with it as well. So if you're a trader, you've got to move. It's a much more reactive way of investing. There's nothing wrong with it, but you have to recognize that that comes with pure trading. And in trading, you are in a sense, at the mercy of the crowd. I'm actually, when I look at all these new tech companies that are trying to take advantage of big data and crowdfunding and crowd wisdom, I'm reminded that the place where we've dealt with crowds for the longest time is financial markets. And my favorite book of all time is called The Madness of Crowds. It's a book that's 150 years old. It's actually by Charles McKay. And what he looked at were big bubbles from the 1600s, the tulip bubble, the, uh, the, the tulip bulbs in, the, in Holland actually you know, went up in price 100,000%, the South Sea bubble. And he talked about how crowds can do incredibly crazy things. It's one of the prices that you pay for a democracy, right? 
we trust in the wisdom of crowds, but at the same time, we have to accept the fact that crowds can sometimes make choices. You say, what the hell were you thinking? What's the nature of crowds? So if you're pricing, you're at the mercy of a crowd that can change its mind like that. So if you're a trader, these are your biggest worries. You have no anchor, you're reactive, and you're at the mercy of the crowd. If you're an investor, you're a valuer, you face two uncertainties. And as I describe them, I want you to think about your company, the value attached to the company, and the price for your company. Here's the first thing you're uncertain about. You're uncertain about your value, right? I hope you are, because if you aren't, there's something very wrong with you. Because you made a lot of assumptions to get there. You got a value, but you're uncertain about the value. The degree of uncertainty will vary across people and vary across companies. But if you really do a valuation, you have to be uncertain, because the inputs are uncertain. So you can try to deal with that uncertainty by doing lots of different things, and I'll talk a few about a few of these. One is, in value investing, there is this measure used as protection called the margin of safety. You've heard of this? Basically, let's say your value for your company is 50 and the stock is 35. It's undervalued, right? So you say, buy the stock. Margin of safety, what you do is you say, look, I could be wrong about the value, therefore I need my stock to be undervalued by at least 40% before I will buy the stock. So essentially what you're doing is you're using your margin of safety as your protection, saying, I could be wrong about the value, so I'm going to put in a margin of safety. So that's one thing you could try. I'll come back and talk about the cost, the trade-off to putting in a margin of safety. The second is you can try to collect more information. I'll make a suggestion. This is a game where the marginal benefits of collecting information drop off very, very quickly. Collecting more information often will make you more uncertain rather than less uncertain. So be careful what you go looking for. Third is you can ask what if questions. What if this, what if that? You could try the growth rate, you could try the cost of capital, and I'm sure some of you already tried it in your DCF. I'm not even sure how many tries you put in before you sent in that final number to me, but you played with the numbers. And the fourth, and uh, we l looked a little bit at this when we did the Royal Dutch valuation, is to face up to uncertainty. So look, I'm uncertain. This is how uncertain I am. Let's see what it does to the value. So we look at those four techniques. All are designed to make you more comfortable with your assessment of value. So the first thing you're uncertain about is that your value could be wrong. There's a second thing you're uncertain about. Even if you feel OK with your value estimate, the price has to move towards your value for you to actually make money, right? So you're uncertain about whether the gap will close or how quick, quickly it will close. And here you have very limited control of the process. One thing that helps you, of course, is you have a longer time horizon because you give the market more time to correct its mistakes. The other is if you can somehow throw a catalyst in something that will cause the gap to close, you've improved your odds substantially, right? You say, how the hell am I going to do that? How do you actually get the gap to close? What, what would you need to do as an investor to actually influence a gap closing? What do Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman do after they've taken a position in a company? In fact, the first thing they do is they call Bloomberg, they call CNBC, do you want me to want to have me on? I, I have something to say. Because the first thing you want to do is let the world know. You don't want to do it secretly, right? Because once you've taken the position, you want the world to know. Not only that you've taken a position, but also be pretty specific about what changes you're going to put in the company. Why are you doing that? You're hoping that that will be the catalyst that creates. And why is it a catalyst? Because you have a track record of having done this in the past, and you have a lot of money. Now you and I, maybe I should just count myself, maybe you have enough money to be the catalyst. I don't have enough money to be a catalyst. I can get on CNBC and say Apple's cheap, but nobody cares really because I'm gonna tell what 5,000 shares of Apple is gonna change the world. So the reality is most of us don't have the power to be catalysts. But we can look for other catalysts. So maybe there's something else in the company in addition to it being undervalued that you're gonna look for before you buy the company, like what? Like maybe the company has a 79-year-old CEO. I know this sounds morbid, but all too often companies change when CEOs move on. And if they don't move on on their own, maybe somebody will help them along the way. Catalysts are critical in investing. It's not just finding cheap companies, it's finding things that cause the pricing gap to change. 
So I'll make some suggestions because I don't have a clean answer to this because I struggle with this on every single company I invest. The first thing you can do is what I call the karmic approach. You have a value of a price, the value is higher than the price, you buy the stock, and then you say what will be, will be, and you let it go. 90% of my investing, that's all I can do. And it takes a struggle because you feel you want to go in and change things you have no control over. It's actually a much healthier way of investing because it says there are only some things I can control. I can control my valuation, but I can't control how the market, it'll save you frustration. It'll also save you from doing really crazy things like doubling down. You know what I mean by doubling down? Stock, you value a company at 50, the stock is at 35. You buy the stock and it goes to 25. You get really pissed off. So what is this market doing? You know what do you do then? Is you buy 100,000 more shares at 25, it goes to 15. I'm gonna really show the market now. I'm gonna take the rest of my money and buy that. Next thing you know, you'll be bankrupt and you'll be wagging your finger at the rest of the world saying, these stupid investors, they drove me into bankruptcy. The things you don't control, but don't double down on your bets. And finally, as a catalyst, as I said, you can either be an activist if you have enough money and a megaphone. And you need the megaphone, right? That's what CNBC and Bloomberg and Wall the Wall Street Journal give you. Or you look for things in the company that you think could potentially cause the pricing gap to change. A news announcement, a CEO change, an acquisition by another company. At this stage in Twitter, my catalyst has to be somebody trying to acquire the company. Because left to its own devices, it doesn't seem to be able to get out of its own way. It looked like I had a catalyst for a little while, you know, with three people supposedly looking at it, but it didn't work out. So as you think about value and price, recognize what you control and recognize what you don't control. And I'll give you an example of a company that I've, as I said, gone in and out of over the last six years. I mean, this is a company I've had in and out of my portfolio for the last 30 years, so it's a company that I've wrestled with. I know I'm incredibly biased, so I've got to be careful about how I value the company. So in this graph, what you have in the green line is the monthly stock price at the end of each month. See all these little boxes? I valued Apple every three months going back to 2010. So every time there's an earnings announcement, I revalue the company. So there's my value of the company. Initially, when I valued the company, it was undervalued, undervalued, undervalued. In fact, I sold it around, I don't know, probably a little too early, I sold it around, somewhere around there, but it continued to be undervalued till the stock hit. So I've kind of adjusted the price because remember they had a seven for one stock split, so it's about $100 per share. Then it stayed, then it went to being, so basically it, went, it, it hit fairly valued and then it went back to being undervalued then you can see again over time that it went back to being over, so it's gone from being undervalued to fairly valued to overvalued over a period of six years. Now these are my valuations, they reflect my story, I could be completely wrong about them, but to me this is the nature of valuation. You value a company, it's not a one-time game. So you value a company today, you look at the price, you might decide to do nothing about it today, but remember you've done the dirty work of valuing the company already. Maintenance valuations take you about 10 to 15 minutes because all you're doing is tweaking the numbers, right? The new earnings report comes out. Now that you've done the work, might as well keep track of these valuations and tweak them because a company that looks undervalued today or overvalued today could reverse itself three months from now, six months from now. It's what makes investing such an interesting game. It's not a one-time buy or sell. It's a continuous process. So I'm going to leave you with a picture from my favorite movie. Remember the Wizard of Oz? You don't remember. I'll tell you the story. It's about this girl called Dorothy who lives in Kansas. She gets plucked up by hurricane tornadoes, a tornado, I think, and dumped into Oz. I don't write these stories, so don't say that sounds unrealistic. A tornado wouldn't dump and she lands on the wicked witch from the east to the west, kills that witch, facing homicide charges. She wants to get back to Kansas. Don't ask me why, I'd have stayed in Oz. And if you remember the start of the movie, she's, it starts with Dorothy landing on the witch and killing her, and then saying, I have to get back to Kansas. And she asks this little munchkin on the side of the road, how do I get back to Kansas? And of course, the answer she's given is, follow the yellow brick road. 
And for two and a half hours, this is a really long movie, all she does is hop and skip. and She never walks down the yellow brick road. She hops and skips. And along the way, she collects a motley crew. Right? There's a scarecrow, there's a lion, there's a tin man. They all need something. And they're all told, follow the yellow brick road to the Wizard of Oz, and he has the answers to everything you need. I'll cut to the chase, because I've used this with the Fed as my analog too. But they get to the Wizard of Oz, and they discover that the Wizard of Oz is really no power. But they also discover that they each got what they wanted along the way. Right? Dorothy got those little red shoes. She didn't realize all she had to do was click those shoes. Can you imagine how much shorter the movie would have been? She just clicked them earlier. Right? And she'd be, and this is the, the cowardly lion gets uh, courage. I mean, they all got it because along the way, they actually figured out how to get it. You think, what's this got to do with valuation? All too often in valuation, we're so focused on that end game. What's that number we get at the end, the value, the value, the present value that we get, that we forget that what you learn in valuation happens on the journey. That's why I keep talking about stories and numbers, is the outcome is the end of the process. It's what you do along the way that allows you to learn valuation. So the next time you do a DCF, don't, get so, don't be in such a hurry to get to the end and get the value. I know you're impatient. You want to see what it is. Spend some time on the process when you think about revenue growth and margins and reinvestment. This is how you understand valuation, is by recognizing those big turns you get in the process. So any questions on value? Because now we're going to jump into the pricing part of this discussion. How the hell did we get two hours ahead? <laughs> this is what happens. I've never got this fall back, spring fall. I could make it fall forward, spring back. It's not a great. So I think whoever's setting the clocks, basically, you know, whatever. Yeah. So let's talk about pricing. Now, I'll skip these two because you've seen these already. Let's cut to the heart of why so much of what we see is pricing. Now remember what I said earlier? Most of what you see out there is pricing. 70, 80, 85% of what passes for valuation is pricing. Let me back up that statement. About 15 years ago, I collected about 550 equity research reports from around the globe. Different bankers, different sectors. I must confess, I didn't read all of them. My objective was to see how analysts attach numbers to companies. So I went through the report and looked to see how they were deciding buy or sell. Out of the 550 equity research reports, 450 were based on a, on a multiple and comparables. PE ratios, EV to EBITDA, revenue to, you know, market cap to revenues. So they were pricing 450. About 45 were intrinsic valuations, discounted cash flow valuations. So less than 10% of sell side equity research is built on discounted cash flow valuation. You think 450 plus 45 is 495. What about the other 55? They were quite scary, in my view. I wasn't sure what was being done. There was uh, you know, introspection, psychological analysis of self. I mean, it was, I mean, I'm not even sure what the number was based on. But among the ones I could categorize, 10 to 1, pricings outnumbered discounted cash flow valuations. So I said, maybe it's different in corporate finance. So I got my hands on about 100 acquisition valuations. It's actually very tough to get your hands on, because bankers, once they do an acquisition valuation, put it under lock and key. You know why? because they never want you to compare their forecasted numbers to what actually happens. But I have my sources, so I was able to get those 100. And I looked through them, and there it looked like it was about half DCF and half multiples. But then I took a closer look at the DCFs, and of course the biggest number in a DCF is the terminal value. And the terminal value in most of these 50 was based on a multiple. So even the DCFs were pricing and drag. So most of what you see in practice out there is pricing. So when you think about pricing, here's a three-step process. You start off by looking at your company and finding similar companies, right? And that's already a subjective judgment. You can't compare stock prices across companies. Why not? If I've just compared stock price across companies and said a high price is expensive and a low price is cheap, penny stocks would all look cheap, right? They're low price. And Berkshire Hathaway would be the most expensive stock in the market. 
price is arbitrary. What I mean by that is by changing the number of units in a company. In a stock split, for instance, I can have the price if I have a two for one stock split. So you can't compare prices, so you have to divide the price by something. That's what all multiples are based on, a standardized price. It's price by earnings, price by book, EV to sales. You're standardizing the price. So you got comparables, you got a standardized price, and then you compare your company to those other companies, and you tell me a story. So basically, it's comparables plus a standardized price plus a story is pricing, and most of what you see out there is pricing. And that surprised me when I first saw it, perhaps because I was m more naive in those days. But I started thinking, that makes no sense to me. And here's why. And you're going to see this as well. At the end of every one of these classes, and this will be the 53rd semester, every one of these sem classes, I ask an exit interview question. So be ready for this. It's actually the same question I asked you at the start of the class, but you weren't quite ready to answer the question then. And the question I'm going to ask you is, and you, you, can, get, you can start thinking about this, is now that you've actually put a number on your company based on a discounted cash flow valuation, based on a pricing, based on whatever else, which of these approaches would you pick as your preferred approach to attaching a number to a company? So now that you actually have experienced this kind of cash flow value, so the question I ask people is, what do you pick? And across the classes, the statistics have actually been pretty, pretty, it's pretty much the same. It's about 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 of the people, when they leave this class, tell me that they're true believers in discounted cash flow valuation. Maybe that reflects my biases, and they think that's what I want to hear. About 20% say this pricing stuff was much better. I don't like this DCF stuff. And about 10% after entangling themselves with one company and trying to put a number on the company say, you know what, I thought markets were stupid. I think they're much smarter than I, think, than I thought at the start of the class. They start to believe in efficient markets. But when you leave this class, if I asked you to pick a technique, given the time and the resources you spent on accumulating this DCF knowledge, many of you walk out of this room saying, I'm going to do DCFs. I haven't done this. Maybe I should do this one of these days. If I tracked you down five or 10 years later, wherever you are, a private equity fund, an investment bank, a consulting firm, and I said, it's been five years since school, and you're putting numbers on companies. How are you putting these numbers? I wager that the statistics shift. So I started thinking about what is it that happened between the time you leave this room and the time you hit a desk and start working that makes you go from being true believers in discounted cash flow valuation to users of pricing. And there are three possible answers that came to me. One came to me while I was watching a Seinfeld episode. Maybe you watch Seinfeld, it's a quintessential New York sitcom. And in this episode, one of Jerry's many girlfriends accuses him of being crazy. He says, Jerry, you're crazy. And he says, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who lives across the hall from me. If you've never watched Seinfeld, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the guy who lived across the hall from Jerry was a guy called Kramer, a guy so crazy that anybody would look sane relative to him. Here's the gift that pricing gives you. Let's face it, when you get on a desk or you start a job, we have to attach a number to a company, it comes with an agenda. Don't complain about it, that's why you're being paid the big bucks. You gotta sell something or buy something based on that number, right? It's so much easier to buy or sell something based on a pricing than using a discounted cash flow valuation. <coughs> Let's try. Let's assume I do a discount. Remember I showed you the DCF valuation I did of Amgen in 2007? Let's say this is 2007. You're a portfolio manager. I'm the sell side analyst who's valued Amgen. And remember the value that I got was 74. The stock is at 55. So Monday morning at 8, 8.30 before the market opens, I call you the portfolio manager with my suggestion of Amgen. I said, look, I think Amgen is a great investment. Let me explain why. I used a 16% return on capital and a 60% reinvestment rate to come up with a 9.6% growth rate. I used a 1.73 beta. By now, you've hung up the phone. Who has time for this at 8.30 in the morning, right? Let me try a different pitch. Amgen looks cheap. It's trading at 12 times earnings. All the other pharma companies trade at 60. It's not the most sophisticated pitch, but it gets a hook in. It's so much easier to sell or buy something based on a pricing than a discounted cash flow valuation. We forget how much a valuation is a tool for selling. Second, it's so much easier playing defense 
with a multiple than with DCI. When you do a discounted cash flow evaluation, your insights are out there for people to pick about. I don't like your beta. Why do you use this growth rate? Why do you stop after five years? Instead, if I told you I priced Amgen based on six times EBITDA because that's what the rest of the sector is being priced at, think of the target I've given you. You don't like six times EBITDA? You know what I'm telling you? Take it up with the market. In fact, whenever I use a pricing, I say it's not my fault. I'm just the messenger. You might not like to pay 40 times revenues for a social media company, but that's what the market is charging. Take it or leave it. It's much easier to defend a pricing than a DC evaluation. And here's the third and final factor, and I think this is the tipping factor, the factor that causes people to use pricing. I remain convinced, and this might just be my faith, that you're more likely to be right in the long term with intrinsic valuation than with pricing. But let me back up. When I say you're more right, I'm talking about you're going to be right 55% of the time. You know what? why well, the 50 is a magical number, right? If you just pick randomly, you're going to be right 50% of the time. So all this work you're putting in is for an extra 5%. But don't bitch and moan about just five. If you can be right 55% of the time, you're a great investor. I think you're going to be right 55% of the time. Maybe with pricing, you're right 51 or 50, if you're a good pricer. But here's the catch. When you do discounted cash flow evaluation and you're wrong, you're more likely to be wrong alone. Think of why. The nature of intrinsic valuation often means that you're going to be buying stocks that other people are selling. You're buying Valiant, you're buying Volkswagen, you're buying Deutsche Bank, because everybody's abandoned them. And you're going to be selling stocks that everybody else is buying. So you're selling Amazon, you're selling Netflix. And when you're wrong, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. And you know what happens to people who are wrong alone? They get fired. First rule in Wall Street or investing is if you're going to screw up, have lots of company. Because then you can say, don't blame me, we all did it. And guess what? When you use pricing, you're always going to be with the crowd, right? You can say, look, I bought Amazon because everybody else was buying Amazon. We all screwed up. You can't fire me because you've got to fire all of us. Don't underestimate the need for survival driving the choices you make. So I'm going to give you a pass in advance. So five years from now when I call and say, what are you doing? And he say, I use PE ratios and comparables. I say, okay, I get it. That's what you need to do given what your job description, what, what the job description for you might be at that point in time. So all I'm saying is don't fall into this Righteousness, where you said discounted cash flow evaluation is the only thing I want to do because even if you're a true believer in intrinsic valuation, I think you should find a way to bring pricing into your toolkit. There's, remember, it's not either or, you can do both. And the reason you have to bring this is because of that gap, right? Because ultimately you've got to make money in the gap and you have to understand what makes the pricing move. You can't take this attitude of the crazy people causing the price to move. You have to try to put yourself in their shoes. So part of what I'm going to try to talk about is how to use pricing better rather than how not to use pricing at all because I think pricing has a place in every investor's toolkit. So let's set up the process. I told you about standardizing prices, right? Let me at least set the framework for how a multiple is created. Every multiple has a numerator and a denominator. That's stating the obvious. But in your numerator, if you have a pricing multiple, you need some measure of market price. So here are your choices. You can look at market capitalization, which is the market value of equity. You can take the market value of equity and add the value of the debt. Market value of debt if you can, but if you're lazy, book value of debt. You have the firm value. So firm value is debt plus equity. The problem with firm value for Apple is there's, you know, you get equity plus debt, you're going to get 750 billion, but 300 billion or 250 billion of that is cash. And because cash is such a different asset from everything else, you might decide to net the cash out of the firm. Market value of equity plus debt minus cash, that's called enterprise value. So market cap is just equity. Market value of the firm is debt plus equity. Market enterprise value is debt plus equity minus cash. So in the numerator, you have no choice. It has to be a market value number. In the denominator, you have lots of choices. You can divide by revenues. Why? Because you're desperate. Desperate in what sense? If you have a company where everything is negative below the revenue line, you have a young startup, what else are you going to do? You, have to, you need to find a positive number, right? 
But let's say you're a startup which doesn't even have revenues yet. Then you get really desperate. So you just started the social media company. You haven't figured out how to make money, but you have lots of users or lots of subscribers who don't pay any money. You know what you do? You take the market value and divide by one of those and say, that's going to drive my future revenues, and therefore that becomes my basis. So market value divided by revenues or the drivers of revenues is your first choice. As you start to make money, your choices expand. You can divide by equity earnings, net income, earnings per share. Or you can divide by earnings for the entire company, operating income. Or if you want to make it a cash flow, you can add the, de the depreciation amortization and come up with EBITDA, or add depreciation to net income and come up with cash flow at equity. So we've gone from revenues to earnings to potentially cash flows. And finally, if you think about accountants as giving you a competing number for your company in the book value, you can divide the market value by the book value, which can either be book value of equity, which is just whatever you see as shareholders' equity, including retained earnings in the balance sheet. It can be book value of equity plus book value of debt, which would be the book value of the entire firm. Or it can be book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash, which is the accountant's analog to enterprise value because it's invested capital. So numerator is a market value number. Denominator can be revenues, it can be earnings, it can be cash flow or book value. One thing I'd suggest is, well, pick up a few equity research reports. You can pull them up online. Look at the multiple that's being used. And before you even go through the report, start asking what's in the numerator, what's in the denominator. Because I'm going to suggest a very simple test you might have to pass on that multiple before you use it. But that's the first step, is understanding what goes into your multiple. Because I'm going to take you through four steps in deconstructing multiples. And the reason I'm going to take you through this process is I will not be able to touch every multiple you will run into, because there are some multiples that haven't been invented yet. People are incredibly creative about what they put in the denominator. So I want to give you a framework where if you're presented with a multiple you've never seen before, you can take this, this process, a four-step process for deconstructing the multiple. I'm going to start off by defining the multiple. And it's going to be mildly in insulting, because you're saying, I know what the PE ratio is. Do you? So when you talk about PE and I talk about PE, are we talking about the same thing? So I'm going to start off by defining the multiple, passing it through a couple of tests to make sure it's a multiple I can use. So I want to make sure it's consistently defined and uniformly estimated. I'll come and back up those two, what I mean by those. Second, I'm going to describe the multiple. Sounds fancy, right? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a histogram of what that multiple looks like today. Remember I said in pricing, your job is a statistical job? So if I asked you, it's 15 times earnings, a high number or a low number. To answer that question, what do you need to know? You need to know what's typical, what's the median, what's the 10th percentile. It's amazing how little we pay attention to the data. So I'm going to show you a histogram so you have a sense of what a low PE or a high PE looks like, not just in the US, but in Japan or Europe or emerging markets, so you get a sense of, you have a framework of reference. Then I'm going to analyze the multiple. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to a discounted cash flow model. And with a little algebra, I'm going to be able to tell you these are the three variables, these are the four variables you have to control for when you use this multiple. And it's going to look like magic, but after you see me do it about three times, you're going to recognize the very simple combination of a DCF model and algebra. And only then am I going to apply the multiple. Define, describe, analyze, apply. My promise people using multiples is not that they use it, but they're, they're in such a hurry to use multiples that they don't want to stop and ask those, go through the first three steps. So let's start with the first of these tests. Is my multiple consistently estimated? Remember I told you multiple as a numerator and a denominator? Here's a very simple rule you always have to follow. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator also has to be an equity value. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator also has to be a firm or an enterprise value. Sounds abstract, right? Let me throw a few multiples at you. And you tell me whether they pass the test. So let's start with PE ratios. What's in the numerator? Equity value, firm value, or enterprise value? For PE ratios. Equity value, market price per share or market capitalization. Denominator is earnings per share. Equity value, firm value, or enterprise value? 
earnings per share is net based on net income. Net income is equity income. Thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world is okay. P/E ratios are internally consistent. There are subtests for consistency; they might fail, but P/E ratio is fundamentally okay. What about the EV to EBITDA? What's in the numerator? Market value equity plus market value of debt minus cash, right? In the denominator, you have a measure of cash flow, a very rough measure of cash flow, but cash flow from the operating assets. So my numerator is an operating asset value. My denominator is an operating cash flow. EV to EBITDA is OK. What about price to EBITDA? For a long time, Bloomberg used to report this on their bunch of multiples until I drew their attention to it, saying, what the hell are you guys doing? Price is a market value for equity concept. EBITDA is to the entire company. Out of the 550 equity research reports I looked at 15 years ago, there were nine that used price to EBITDA as the basis for picking companies. One of them happened to be somebody who went through this class almost a decade earlier. I recognize his name. I went through. He's an unusual name. So I called him and asked him, what the hell are you doing? The multiple is not consistently defined. First, he said, who are you? I said, remember this valuation class you took <laughs> about a decade ago? He said, vaguely. I said, it shows. I said, what are you doing? Dividing market value of equity by EBITDA, it's not consistent. He said, no, no, I'm being consistent. I said, what do you mean? He said, I use price to EBITDA for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, that's a very strange definition of consistency. Have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt in your sector keep looking cheap to you? He said, yes, yes. I've often wondered about that. I said, have you stopped wondering and actually digging at what you're using? Do you see why? If you use price to EBITDA, you're going to find highly levered companies look cheap to you. Let's play a game. Let's suppose you have a company that goes out, borrows $10 billion, and buys back stock. So remember, when you buy back stock, you knock down the number of shares in the company. Your market cap is going to shrink. But if you're looking at EBITDA, it's before interest taxes, the depreciation, amortization. That number is not going to change. If your debt goes from $1 billion to $10 billion to $20 billion, highly levered companies are going to look cheap on a price to EBITDA basis. Before you get too high and mighty about this, if you've ever used a price to sales ratio, widely used multiple on Wall Street, you're guilty of the same set. Because revenues belong to the whole company. You know why most people get away with it? What sectors do you see price to sales used most frequently in? Remember the desperation thing that I opening I gave you? Usually for Younger companies, technology companies. Do you see why you get away with price to sales in those companies? It's because they tend not to. It's accidental. They didn't tend not to have debt, but they're starting to accumulate cash. So even in those companies, you have to worry about using price to sales. So is this multiple consistently defined? Second question I'm going to ask you, is it uniformly estimated? you see why this matters? If I'm going to compare this across 15 companies, it better be estimated the same way for all 15. That's a really tough test to meet. Because all I'm asking you then is to make sure earnings per share are computed exactly the same way for all 15 companies. We used to think that we had the same accounting standards, that we were home free on this one. But we've discovered in the last 15 to 20 years that you can have the same accounting standards. GAAP and IFRS cover every company and different degrees of fidelity to those standards. Aggressive companies can look cheap to you because they've played games with the earnings to make them go up. They're legal games. You're allowed to do it. But you have to make sure they're uniformly estimated. In fact, the S&P for a little while actually redid the earnings for every company to try to make them uniform. In other words, it, went, it gave up on it because there were so many complications. But you can see why they did it. Because when I compare PE ratios across companies, I am implicitly assuming that you're following exactly the same rules and following them in exactly the same way. So let's start by taking a few multiples, passing them through this consistency test. I told you P-E ratio is the most widely used multiple in the world. Everyone knows what the P-E ratio is. Even Anna Kornikova seemed to know what the P-E ratio is. Remember Anna Kornikova? She masqueraded as a tennis player for like 10 years, won nothing, but was in every commercial you could think of. Think of Maria Sharapova without the talent, and you got Anna Kornikova, right? So for 10 years, never wins a tournament. And she gets on. She's, this is from a Schwab commercial that they made. I almost shut down my Schwab account after I saw this commercial. Because in this commercial, here's what's happening. 
Anna Kornikova is playing somebody. Must have been an actress. She was actually winning. And in tennis, every two games, you switch sides to make, make sure the sun is not in your eyes. So you're switching sides. In the middle of a tennis match, Anna turns to this actress she's playing and says, price earnings ratios, price divided. Why this would come up in the middle of a tennis match, I don't know. <laughs> and then she kept going about preferred dividends. And I, she lost me on that. I turned off the TV and started thinking, does Anna Kornikova really know what the PE ratio is? But let's face it, the numerator is usually easy, right? We all kind of agree it should be the market price today. Unless you're one of those technical analysts gone crazy, the ones I'm talking about who like to use moving averages for everything, to which my response has always been, have you ever tried buying a stock at a 52-week moving average price? Try. Call your brokers, I'd like to buy the stock at a 52-week moving average price. The stocks you will buy are stocks you don't want to buy, because the 52-week moving average price is like seven times higher than the current price. The rest you're going to say, it's not going to happen. But it's the denominator that you get the real variation, right? I could divide price per share today by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year. That's called current PE. I could divide price per share today by earnings per share in the last four quarters, which is trailing PE. I can divide price per share by expected earnings per share in the next four quarters, which is forward PE. I can divide price per share today by expected earnings per share in the year 2025, which is really, really forward PE. Why would I do that? Desperation drives me to do strange things. I'm the biotech analyst. Every company in my sector is losing money. You know how I deal with that? I project out the earnings per share 10 years out. I divide the price today by that expected earnings per share. This stock looks cheap. It's trading at seven times 2025 earnings. I'm always scratching your head saying, what the hell do I do with that? You buy the stock because it looks cheap. I can divide by earnings per share before extraordinary items, after extraordinary items, before stock-based compensation. I mean, I'll give you a challenge. Pick any widely, for pick your company. I'll wager you can write out 20 to 25 price earnings ratios for that company today, depending on your definition of earnings. You think, so what? Remember I said, if you're doing valuation, you usually have an agenda. Let's say you are convinced, you're trying to sell me a company. So what do you want to show me, a low PE or a high PE to convince me to buy this company? You want to show me the lowest PE. So this stock is cheap. It's trading at seven times earnings. So as you look across your 25 PE ratios that you computed for your company, guess which one you're going to latch on to? You're going to latch on to the lowest one based on forward earnings. Bullish analysts love forward earnings. You know why? Because it makes everything look cheap. Bearish analysts love historical trailing earnings because it makes things look expensive. So you know what your job and my job is? And somebody across the table says, this stock is cheap. It's trading at 12 times earnings. Before you go down and look at the intuition and the logic, what's the first question you need to ask? What's your definition of PE? They're going to look at you as if you have two heads and say, even Anna Kornikova knows what the PE ratio is. To which your response should be, Anna's much smarter than I am. Tell me what you're using. It. Because I can't even talk about whether 12 is high or low until I know what your definition is. In fact, if I'd been making that commercial, the one thing I'd have changed is I'd have made the actress turn to Anna Kornikova and say, forward earnings or trailing earnings, Anna? Then we'd have known whether Anna Kornikova really understands PE ratios. So let's stay on PE ratios, because it passes the consistency test. But now I want to talk about something we had to deal with in discounted cash flow valuation, which is some companies reward their employees with options. So let's say you're in the tech sector. You computed the PE ratios across tech companies. And you're trying to decide what is the best, the most consistent way to compute PE ratios when some companies have lots of options and others don't have options, when some companies have in-the-money options and some have out-of-the-money options. So let me go through the choices. And what I want you to think about is if you use this multiple, what are the biases you're going to end up with? What types of companies you'll end up buying too much of because the multiple is not consistent? I could divide price by primary earnings per share. You know what that is? I take the net income and divide by the actual number of shares outstanding. If I do that, what kinds of companies am I going to overload my portfolio with? Companies with lots of options or companies with no options? What happens if you have lots of options? Your market cap has to go down to reflect the fact that you've given away big chunks of the company, right? But when I divide to come up with your PE ratio, I'm ignoring all those shares. so. If I use primary PE, I'm going to find myself finding companies with lots of options look cheap to me relative to ones that don't have options. 
What if I use fully diluted earnings? Basis? That should take care of the problem, right? That does take care of the number of options you have, but what does it do in terms of how it treats those options? You have an in the money option or at the money option, it treats them as essentially equivalent. In fact, it even takes out of the money options if it's fully diluted. You're going to find yourself buying a lot of companies with significant in the money options are going to look cheap because basically the market cap is going to be low. Am I going through the, let me make sure I'm getting the reasoning right here. The market cap is going to reflect the fact that a lot of the money options, if fully diluted shares will now include the options outstanding. Yeah, so you basically find yourself ignoring the companies where there are lots of in the money options and overloading on companies with out of the money options. In fact, the best way to probably set this, set this up in an Excel spreadsheet. Some have options, some don't have options, some have in the money. In fact, I would suggest to you that no per share PE ratio is going to work for you. So you know what you have to do? You're not going to like it. If you have differences in options across companies, to get PE ratios that actually are comparable, you have to start with the market cap and then add the value of the options outstanding. You see why you have to add the value? Because those options were reducing your market cap. You have to add the value of the options valued as options. It's exactly what you were running away from in discounted cash flow valuation, chasing you down. And then divide by the net income. When you have lots of options outstanding, avoid computing multiples on per share numbers, because those per share numbers are going to create nightmares for you. Work with aggregate numbers, aggregate market cap, aggregate net income, and adjust for those options by actually valuing them and bringing them into the game. Now let's take enterprise value to EBITDA. Numerator is market value by equity plus debt minus cash. And in the denominator, I have earnings before interest tax. This is the most, the fastest growing multiple news in sell side equity research. In the mid 1980s, when I first became familiar with sell side equity research, maybe one in 50 reports would use EV to EBITDA. Today, you walk into any sell side house, you look at the equity research reports, a third of all equity research reports are based on EV to EBITDA. So I'm going to ask a question that I often ask analysts who use EV to EBITDA. Let's see if you can give me the right answer. You see, in the numerator, I've netted out cash. Why do I net out cash when I compute EV to EBITDA multiples? Why do I use net debt rather than gross debt? Because when I do PE ratios, I took the entire market cap, right? I didn't net cash out. Why, when I do EV to EBITDA, do I net cash out? Yes. It's a dangerous door you've opened. What if I have other liquid assets? Should I net, be netting them out as well? Because I could sell them and pay down the debt as well. Why just cash? It's, so liquidity is an issue, but it's not the reason we net the cash out. Anybody else? I'll, yeah. It's ex that's exactly the answer. The denominator is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. The income from cash is not part of the debit, so we should net that out. But now do you see what else I should be netting out? Remember your cross holdings discussion? When you have minority holdings in another company, 5%, 10%, 15% of another company, what happens? You have to report the income from those holdings, but below your operating income line. So when you do EBITDA for a company with a lot of cross holdings, like Tata Motors, my market cap includes the value of those cross holdings because the market knows, but my denominator does not include the EBITDA from those cross holdings. If I wanted to be consistent, I can do it in one of two ways. I can net out the value of my minority holdings from my numerator, in addition to netting out cash, or I can add 10% of EBITDA for company A. In other words, I've got to augment the denominator for the EBITDA from those holdings. A nightmare if you have 150 holdings. But guess what? It was a nightmare in DCF. Why do you think it's not going to be a nightmare in pricing? And what happens if you have a majority holding? You should be reviewing this for the quiz, right? Let's see how ready you are. Let's assume you have company A owns 60% of company B. I want to compute an EV to EBITDA for this company. Lead me through the process. I take company A's market cap. I add to it the debt from the balance sheet. But it's a consolidated balance sheet, right? So I'm adding in 100% of the debt of company B. I subtract out cash, 100% of. So in other words, every number other than market cap reflects full consolidation. 
But the market knows you own only 60%. It's not doing stupid things like consolidating. You've got a mismatch, right? Your numerator, market cap is 60%. Every other number is at 100%. So you know what analysts try to do to fix this problem? What do they add to the numerator to try to get it back into sync? Is there something on the balance sheet that gives you at least a number to put on the remaining 40%? You're in big trouble for Wednesday, I can see, on this problem. There's a minority interest that you show, right? 40%. So what analysts will do is add the 40%, the minority interest, and hope and pray the problem has gone away, when in fact it's just become a little messier, because now you've added a book value, which is what the minority interest is, to your market value. It's a recipe for disaster. But again, it was a problem when we did DCF. It's going to be a problem when you do pricing as well. Let's take a very different example, especially in the aftermath of 2008 when housing prices collapsed. One of the things that housing analysts started thinking about is maybe we're too inbred. We talk to each other and everything looks okay because we talk to each other and the housing prices look okay. Maybe we need to start to compare how much you're paying for houses to how much you're paying for stocks and how much you're paying for bonds so you can look at it on a relative basis. So here's the way it would work. If I told you the PE ratio for stocks is 15, what multiple of rental income should you be willing to pay for a house? Maybe they can I can come up with a multiple for housing. So the question then becomes what the right comparison is. Let me give you one ratio that some housing analysts came up with. And I want you to think about what the analogous number would be in the stock market for you to make the comparison. Because remember, you want to compare apples to apples. So one measure they take is they take the housing price. So let's say you pay $250,000 for a house and divide by the annual rental income you'd make on that house. So the housing price is two fifty, dollars and you can rent that house out for $1,000 a month. Let's make it $2,000 a month. You're going to get $24,000 in rental income. $250,000 divided by $24,000 will give you roughly 10.4 or 10.3 as a multiple in housing. That's perfectly appropriate, right? You've divided the price of the house by the rental income. Now, if I wanted to, dis to make a judgment on whether that was a higher or lower number by looking at what stocks were priced at, what is the analogous multiple I would use in the stock market to see if that 10.4 that I'm paying for earnings in the housing market is high or low? Can I use price earnings ratios? What's the question I'm asking you? The housing multiple I computed, was that an equity multiple? or an enterprise value multiple. What's in the numerator? I took the full price you paid for your house, even though you might have borrowed 85%. So it's the full price of the house. And the rental income is, not, is before interest expenses, so it's like an operating income, right? It might used to have expenses, but it's an operating income. It's closer to an EV2, so the numerator has to be a, but what should be the denominator, EBIT or EBITDA? Rental income is? just operating income. If you get to depreciate your house, then it will be added to the, so the multiple you'd use for the comparison would be EV to EBIT. I know it sounds messy, but think about it for a moment. Because you're taking the housing price, the numerator has to be EV. Because you're taking rental income, and I'm assuming the expenses are small enough that I don't have to factor it out because that might be the issue, because it's more like an operating income before maintenance expenses, et cetera you might decide that the right multiple to use is EV to EBIT because it's closest to a housing price to rental income. In fact, there are some very interesting studies that have come out, especially in the last decade, on comparing these ratios across markets. So you can invert the T-bond rate, you can invert the P uh, P ratio, you can invert the rental income, and you can put them all on the same graph to see if one is getting out of sync with the other. Because I think this is one way in which you could potentially add value in the market is looking across markets. So that's the first step, is defining, make sure the multiple is consistently defined. Let's talk about the descriptive test. It's pure statistics. Right? Basically, you're looking at what's high, what's low. You're looking at the distribution. You're also, also asking a question you generally don't tend to ask about samples, which is when we talk about something like PE or EV to EBITDA and computing them for companies, remember there are lots of companies for which you cannot compute that number. Why? Because you have negative earnings, negative EBITDA. You have to ask yourself, am I creating a bias in my sample by throwing out those companies? So I'm going to end today with a couple of graphs. At the start of every year, I take all of the US companies for which I can compute a PE ratio, 
and I draw a histogram. So this is actually the histogram from start of 2016. 0 to 4 all the way to 100 and over. In fact, I've artificially cut off the tail on the right hand side because I could keep going. Remember I told you the multiple would not be normally distributed? Well, there's the evidence. It's got the peak to the left, the tail to the right. And I can guarantee you, no matter what multiple you look at, it's going to look very much like this one. Why? Because the PE ratio cannot be less than 0. You're going to get a tail sticking out of the other side. Now, if you're wondering, so, and I've got current forward and trailing, and they all have the same characteristic. Now, here's why it matters. Remember we talked about average PE? That's what a lot of analysts use as the average. I don't know whether you were told the same thing I was in my first statistics class. I was told if I have an asymmetric distribution, a distribution like this one, I should never trust the average. Why not? All your outliers are big positive numbers. You know what's going to happen to your average, right? It's going to get pulled out. You say, how much can it matter? I'm going to show you some statistics on how much it exactly matters in the US market. So these are start of 2016, current PE, trailing PE, and forward PE. Let's start at the top. There were 7,480 US companies in my sample. That's a pretty big sample, right? But if you look at the current PE, I was able to get the current PE for only 3,300 of those companies. How come? What am I already telling you? Almost 60% of my sample is negative earnings. They fell out of my sample. I still have a big sample, but it's a biased sample because the kinds of companies that have negative earnings tend to be smaller, riskier, younger, higher growth. So I create bias already, and that bias actually gets worse as I go from current PE to trailing PE to forward PE. I lose another 600 companies. Why? What do I need for forward PE? I need expected earnings in the next four quarters. There's no way I'm sitting down estimating expected earnings for 7,480 companies. So you know what I look for? Forecasted earnings for these companies. And to get those forecasted earnings, what has to be true about these companies? Who comes up with these estimates for future earnings? Analysts do. So if you're not tracked by an analyst or followed by an analyst, you drop out of my sample. The multiple you use already creates bias in the process. Be aware of it. Let's go further down. The average PE for a US stock at the start of 2016 was 59. Shocking, right? That's huge. But before you get too freaked out, the median PE was 18.5. There's the outlier effect because there was one stock with a PE ratio of 32,269. Don't get too excited. It wasn't a stock trading at some huge price. The earnings per share dropped to a fraction of a cent. That's why we want to focus. So the way you'd use this, if I came to you with a stock with a PE ratio of 20, you can't compare to the average and say this is cheap. You've got to compare to the median. And across the board, you can see this effect kick in. It's a little less pronounced when you go to forward PE, the, the, the biggest numbers. But PE ratios are always going to have this effect. So I'm going to close with the last graph. Until about uh, 10 years ago, I used to do this just for US companies. Then I'd end up in Mumbai or Sao Paulo, and I'd present this graph. And some old analysts, you know, usually in his 50s or 60s, put up his hand and say, it doesn't look anything like that in Mumbai. Saying so anything like what? Our distributions probably don't have that peak to the left and tail to the right. And so how do you know? It's a gut feeling. And after about the 10th gut feeling, I said, you know what? I don't trust your gut. Let me check out the numbers. So starting about 10 years ago, I've started doing this across markets. And guess what? Every single market that I look at has a peak to the left and a tail to the right. So you can see US, Europe, Japan, emerging markets. What's different is that the pricing varies across markets. If I ask you what the most expensive market was at the start of 2016, look at the median values. The most expensive market at the start of 2016 was the US market. If I ask you what the cheapest market was at the start of 2016, it was the Japanese market. Does that mean you should sell all your US stocks and buy Japanese stocks? I'm not quite ready to go there, but it's good to know that when I give you a Japanese company, you should expect to see a PE ratio a little lower than for a US company for whatever reason. And that's the reason you look at the distribution is to get a better sense of what's high, what's low, and what's typical. So let's stop there. When we come back, we'll, we'll pick up with the rest of PE ratio. But uh, that'll be after the quiz. So the quiz will be in the first 30 minutes.
three things of meditation. There's your kind of different from the scripture of thought or to that. In the depth of level, so all the level is written from the thought. And I assume that companies are given check for restriction on the thought. And I kind of isolate the one thought. The problem with being relation is those who I can't isolate the effect. I can't, if I can come up with a multiple, that somehow the body drifts and goes from the turning of the internet, then I should probably just use the law of the internet. But every multiple will be two, maybe three, or maybe five people. So I can't do the law of the internet number unless I start to see the chances of other companies that have similar risks, similar goals, and similar controls, and the problem will end up with it. And it's going to go off small numbers. It's going to end up with really big chances. But if you can find, I'll tell you the checklist of the law of the internet. Some sectors it might work. A lot of sectors are too many variables in our control. A lot of large numbers. Okay. I think I said this. The beta is then more. It's a statistical problem. In fact, you know, this yeah. this question. Remember, the law of large numbers requires you to assume that they all have the same distribution. You're just messing up on the distribution. And if that's not true, then averaging across companies is not giving you the truth about the distribution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, I am a little bit concerned about my evaluation. Uh, come in and talk to me, because yeah. I think what you've done is you've broken your stuff down into so much detail. You lost. So I wanted to do kind of a bottom up because you the you way can that do that. Doing so what I would do is create those pages, create a revenue page. We do all the revenue breakdown. Take a cost page, create a revenue, do a worksheet, and then have a page where you just pull them all together, uh -huh. so you can get a big picture perspective on what your different assumptions are fitting. Because what's happening right now is because each line item takes on a life of its own, when you look at the final numbers, if I ask you what's your story for the company, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult for you to come up with a story because there's so many different strands that you used to mm -hmm. come up with.